The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the final installment of the HGSA Research Webinar Series for 2016. This is George Yorling from HGSA, and I'm very excited to have Dr. Lee Henderson uh, from Vibion joining us today to talk about an innovative new approach to uh, tackle Huntington's disease. Um, we're, these are uh, a new approach or a new therapeutic approach called intrabodies. Um, but before I introduce Dr. Henderson, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of background as I normally do for those that may be new to this GoToWebinar uh, platform of how you can, how you can ask questions. Um, at any point during the presentation in the questions box that's outlined on, in red, just type a question and at the end of Dr. Henderson's webinar, uh, we'll ask them on your behalf. So like I said, type them at any point. We are recording this. So within one week after the webinar, you should be able to accept, access this um, through our national website, hgsa.org, or on our YouTube channel, which I, is a little hard to find, but is, I've highlighted here in red, this red circle in the middle icon. If you click on this YouTube icon, you'll be able to see not only this webinar, but um, uh, all of our other webinars that we've been holding since 2013. Uh, we are planning for 2017, and uh, this is an upcoming schedule for January 11th next year. We're going to have Dr. Andy McGarry, who's from Cooper Health here in New Jersey, as well as uh, a member of the Huntington Study Group, where he is going to be presenting the recently uh, completed uh, Pride HD clinical trial. He'll be presenting the results to the community through a webinar on January 11th. And then the tentative date is for February 1. I will be presenting a, as I usually do, a, a research year in review uh, for the past year. Uh, if there are any questions or, or topics that folks would like to hear more about, uh, feel free at any point you can send your comments to researchupdates at hdsa.org. So as I mentioned, uh, we, we are joined today by Dr. Lee Henderson. Uh, Dr. Henderson is currently the CEO of a company in New York, Ithaca, New York, I believe, uh, Lee, is is where Vibion is. Um, Dr. Henderson, over 20 years ago, launched a company called Viral Therapeutics, when he subsequently sold the, the, uh, the assets to Meridian Biosciences in 2008 and relaunched the new company as Vibion. Uh, in 2011, Vibion collaborated with the group at Caltech and subsequently developed a, a first-in-class potentially disease-modifying intrabody gene therapy for HD which is currently in preclinical uh, development, and you're going to be hearing more about that uh, during Dr. Henderson's presentation. Uh, Lee has, has developed over tw 10 biologic drugs and was active in the hemorrhagic fever virus consortium, developing the first FDA-approved di diagnostic assays for Lassa fever and Ebola viruses. Um, Lee has helped launch several startup companies and served on advisory boards at Cornell University and the Rockefeller Institute, or sorry, Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, he was formerly on the faculty at Tulane Medical School, received his Ph.D. from the University of South Carolina in biochemistry in 1981, and subsequently received a, uh, post, or completed a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the Cancer Research Institute while at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Dallas. And uh, Lee is joining us to discuss his work and his team's work on intrabodies, a new drug class and potential new drug, I call, which is called INT41, for Huntington's disease. So I'm going to turn over the presenter rights to you, Lee, and the stage will be all yours. Yeah. Can everyone, I assume everyone can see. Um, let me start off by uh, a little bit of Trying to get back to the. Uh, just keep going. Hit your left arrow. There you go. Yeah, it was uh, doing some weird things. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, there you go. Got it. So, uh, just to make sure that everyone is uh, on the same page, uh, as you obviously are 
are well aware uh, Huntington's disease is a motor as well, well as cognitive function uh, issue that's related to CAG repeats in the Huntington gene uh, which encodes, and the, each of those CAG repeats encodes a uh, glutamine residue, which is a positively charged amino acid, and that the um, uh, the dis adult disease, you know, and, the, and these are there. Are, there are quite a number of these uh, polyglutamine uh, repeat uh, type proteins and other diseases associated with these sort of extended links of uh, polyglutamine. Uh, within Huntington's, the <clears throat> typical adult is somewhere in the 37 to, to 70 repeats, uh, more typically in the uh, 50 range, and then juvenile is uh, um, a much higher repeat. And some of the very recent studies have really confirmed that the early onset is associated with the uh, more extended uh, uh, repeats. There are <clears throat> a number of a number of things that are uh, consistent in the pathology. There's uh, uh, aggregates that are formed. Uh, HTT stands for uh, Huntington's, uh, so it's just an abbreviation that's used throughout. Uh, there is, there's aggregation of these proteins, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's uh, neurodegeneration neurodegener and, and loss of neurons in certain regions of the brain. Uh, some of the other things that occur and, and very early on in, in pre-symptomatic, uh, you can detect uh, gene dysregulation. And what that really means is that, you know, each cell is producing uh, or, or, or turning on a number of genes, and those are regulated in a, in a, a very refined way. And uh, in Huntington's disease, these genes are have much altered regulation. So you've got literally hundreds of genes that are either producing more than they should be producing or less than they are producing. Uh, the Huntington or HTP fragments bind to DNA as well as RNA and interact in a number of ways. And that is believed to be connected to the uh, gene dysregulation, as we'll see that that's I think our data strengthen that uh, that notion. Uh, so let me go to the next slide then. So there, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the drug classes. There are, <clears throat> and I've got basically uh, just a few here. You've got a number of uh, drug classes which fall into what I call uh, metabolic targets, and many of these have not fared very well. In the in the clinic, even though some of the animal models it looked like they uh, they, they might have some efficacy, the believe that based on our results and the results of many others, that the the real difficulty with these metabolic targets is that you do have such gene dysregulation, and that targeting these sort of endpoints of that process. Um, is, is, is going too far downstream for symptoms. A number of other approaches are um, the uh, HTT or Huntington's expression, gene expression with interfering RNA and zinc finger. Um, as we've talked to neurologists, the real concern that they have broadly, not only with that, but also with ours as well, is whether or not we're altering the expression of the of the normal allele, so you're producing uh, you're producing product or Huntington protein from two alleles, one which has mutation and one which uh, does not. And if you're altering the expression of the one that's normal, then the the thought is that long term that may have uh, real consequences. So our uh, um, approach is to target uh, much further downstream and target the protein, uh, what's called N-terminal fragments or these toxic fragments and, 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 and some of their biological effects uh, rather than going very far upstream and targeting gene expression or targeting <clears throat> the, uh, the sim symptoms around the uh, gene dysregulation. Uh, so let me um, go and and go back to talk a little bit about what what interbodies are. 
Uh, so antibody drugs you've probably heard of. You, if you watch the news every night, you see commercials about anti antibody drugs. And if you look at the names, anything that has MAB at the end is an antibody drug. Uh, this is a, a very fast-growing therapeutic class. They have a very good safety uh, profile. Uh, and they're used for a wide range of diseases. They're injection or infusion because they're systemic uh, targeting. So these are, are, are very successful uh, class of drugs. Uh, intrabodies are, are much smaller formats of antibodies. And these, are, these can function inside of cells. The trick is how to get them there. And they're delivered as a, a piece of DNA that's packaged into a virus. And these, uh, the virus is typically adeno-associated virus, which has been around for a long time, and has got a fair amount of clinical experience around it, too. So uh, uh, it's being used in Parkinson's. Uh, others are using it in, two, in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, but also in a wide range of diseases like hemophilia, uh, and others. So it seems to be a, a pretty good delivery system. The, um, the, and and the, the DNA doesn't incorporate into the cell's DNA, so it remains as a, as a separate entity. And if it incorporated into cell DNA, it would be problematic. Um, now the, the, the issue has always been with uh, intrabodies. The concept has been around for about 20 years, but there's a real difference chemically between the inside of a cell and the outside of a cell. And that difference, without explaining the details of that, leads to the inability of an antibody or an intrabody to actually function inside of a cell. And we de uh, uh, developed a, a platform. Uh, part of this was with uh, Cornell University some years back. And that's when we did that switch in 2008 and developing out that platform. So we can select for intrabodies that um, um, not only uh, have uh, function inside of cells, but have, meet the solubility standards. Because one of the other issues is that intrabodies inside of cells normally aren't terribly soluble. And that speaks to the differences in the, in the chemistry in, in the inside of the cell versus the outside of the cell. So the real question remains is whether intrabodies can have the same safety profile and efficacy of monoclonal antibodies. And that really remains to be seen at this point. But that's the difference between uh, antibodies and intrabodies. So with intrabodies, we're hoping to take the, uh, the best features of, of antibodies, and that's their, their good safety profile, their very precise targeting, very low off-target effects, which is very important in, uh, in, in developing drugs. So the off-target effects are extremely low, and their efficacy, and translate what we see in antibody drugs into the, uh, the inter intrabody uh, drugs as well. And that's really in the, in the form of the stages. And there are a number of labs that are developing that uh, uh, intrabodies. So as, um, as George mentioned, we started this with a collaboration with the late Paul Patterson at Caltech, who developed an HEP-1. And we published a number of papers, and we actually have the gene for that, and did a number of parallel experiments. We initially were going to develop HEP-1 for the, uh, to go into the clinic. But we, and it had some really exceptional um, results that have all been published in very early animal models, early administration rather. So they administer the drug uh, in, in pups that are like two or three days old. Uh, so and, and the, the results were actually quite good. But what we what we found with the HAP1 molecules it has some stability issues and if uh, it's, if it's administered later in the development in either an animal model or a cell system, it actually drives a, a, a faster aggregation process and could potentially be more toxic. So we were unable to modify the HAP1 and we developed our, our, our own panel of about uh, half a dozen or so intrabodies that hit the same uh, target sequences. 
And the target sequences are these uh, proline-rich regions, which, uh, see my pointer doesn't seem to work, but on, if you look on the second bullet, there's a very specific proline-rich region se sequence, which I'll get to in just a moment. So we developed those, they have good solubility, good stability, and we've used those in cell-based systems and uh, as well as animal systems. And uh, of the half a dozen, we chose one to, to move forward based on its uh, properties. So just to take a little bit of a step back and give you a little bit more background, uh, this is a depiction of the, uh, the Huntington protein, at least a, a linear uh, depiction of it with uh, the amino side on the left and the carboxyl side on the right. The uh, polyglutamine expansion is shown in red and the proline rich region is shown in blue. And the um, target sequences that are within this proline rich region. Now a little bit about the proline rich region is it's 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 involved in protein protein interaction so the other molecules that interact with it. In any protein that is produced in your body or any gene that produces a protein, you, you, you reach a, a steady state uh, that includes not only the synthesis of new protein but the degradation of old protein. And as old proteins are, are degraded, there are proteases that cut these up into various pieces. And you see, note, note on there, there's a, a, a protease cut. Uh, and there are quite a number of these that chop this up into small fragments. But this so-called N-terminal fragment uh, can, drives the aggregation process. And it's an indicator of instability. And as the, the mutant Huntington protein generates this N-terminal fragment, that's at least part of the process of of aggregation and, and is directly associated with, uh, with toxicity. So that's an important feature that that, that N-terminal piece which has the polyglutamine stretch as well as the proline rich region and we'll come back to that uh, in, in just a few minutes because that's very relevant to the, uh, to the discussion. So uh, INT41 was used, uh, and I'll show a little bit of the animal model system we use, and R62 is a mouse model. model. It's, uh, it, it, the gene of uh, Huntington's is chopped up into a number of exons, so the first exon is actually encodes the region that has this N-terminus on it. So and it's an exon 1. Uh, transgenic, so it's introduced genetically into the uh, uh, into the into the DNA of the animal, and it produces that exon one con constitutively or basically all the time. This is a very rapid model. The number of, of CAG repeats or glutamines is 120. Uh, animals are born with aggregates, uh, so the this is very quick and animals typically start dying at about, uh, at about 12 weeks. So we, in this particular model, <coughs> administered uh, uh, INT41, which was packaged into AAV, and, and we used a, uh, an AAV uh, virus uh, called uh, AAV6, and we did that because it's uh, neurotropic and has the, the right properties for what we believe is, um, is going to be a good delivery system. And, and part of this has been, uh, um, we, we do a lot of work with a group in, uh, at UCSF, uh, Chris Bankowitz's group, which is a, a neuroscience translational uh, medicine. And we've been using them and selecting uh, viral types as well as strategies going forward. So we administer this by injection. It's a slow injection into the striatum region uh, when animals are about five weeks old. And at this point, they're already uh, uh, beginning to show symptoms. It takes about two to three weeks to get optimal expression. And the animals were sacrificed at 12 weeks because we wanted to understand what was going on 
in the in the brain uh, of these animals. So this is a <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that a function test that was done in those animals at about nine to ten weeks. <coughs> and if you look at the the left are the male bar is wild type, so that's normal. And this is the cognitive function test is actually a swim test. So the animals are put into a trough that's shaped like a T and it's filled with water. And one end of the T is a platform where they can climb out. And they have to learn where that platform is and show that they can repeat that multiple times in order to uh, pass the test. So the normals are the, the white bar. The black is the control, and we delivered another gene, an irrelevant gene called uh, GFP or green fluorescent protein, as a as a control gene. And you can see, and then the green is the delivery of I41. You could see in the males that INT41 is uh, is 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 a little bit better, but not statistically. Uh, significant better than the um, than GFP, but what you see in females, and this is largely we believe because females progress at a rate that's about two weeks slower than males. You see no difference between the um, the animals that had that are uh, wild type with the op uh, the white bar as and or the animals that receive INT41. And the GFP gives you the uh, uh, the control group. So you see that in the in the female mice, their their cognitive function is essentially equivalent to the uh, to the control. And uh, we had these studies done by a group that does a lot of studies on quite a few Huntington's drugs. And this was they said it was a very very unusual in their view. They didn't didn't see these kinds of results with uh, many of the other drugs that they've uh, tested, and they've tested over 100 different drugs, many of which have gone into the clinic. When we look at motor function, and this is just one of uh, one motor function, this is male hind limb uh, grip strength. What you see in the, um, in the animals with the, say, the open circles and the solid bar, that's the wild type, uh, the uh, open squares, with the solid bar, that's the that's INT41, and then uh, the uh, uh, blackened squares is the control. Uh, so those animals begin are they track pretty well up until about um, the, uh, the the period after INT41 expression is uh, is begins to be optimal. So that's where you see a real divergence. So you see the GFP or the control animals uh, uh, begin to uh, decline very rapidly, whereas with INT41 they begin to stabilize. So what we've observed <clears throat> throughout a, a, a lot of different tests is uh, either improvement and or stabilization of loss in not only cognitive function but also in uh, motor function. So we were very encouraged by the uh, by the initial data. When we went to look at aggregations, since uh, the uh, Huntington protein aggregation is associated very strongly with, uh, with uh, progression and pathology, uh, we looked at these very small aggregates. And one of the reasons we looked at small aggregates, we could actually, uh, using histology, we used a program. We actually had a had, a, uh, had this all done by the pathology group that we, uh, we hired to do the analysis. Um, you, you basically scan multiple large areas and count the number of, uh, of aggregates and also count the, the size of those aggregates. And what we find is that the very small aggregates that are less than 0.1 microns, we see a, a, almost a third uh, decrease in those female mice that uh, that we saw the very good cognitive results in. 
and the and 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 a, a, about a 16 percent increase in the aggregates and excise up. Now those aggregates will go up to uh, uh, up to microns, so they get very large. The important thing to remember here, though, is that the animals are born with aggregates, and by the time they're even a few weeks old, they have a few weeks old. They have lots of aggregates in their brain, <clears throat> so that process is being driven uh, the entire time, which is the reason why we looked at small aggregates. So. We reason that INT41, which binds to this proline-rich region, we thought that it may stabilize, based on the results that we've seen, the, these, uh, the aggregate formation. And since the aggregate formation is being driven by this N-terminal fragment that I described a moment ago, we thought that the formation of new aggregates is where we should begin to look. And that's, in fact, what we found is that we see a decrease in the formation of new aggregates. Now, all of that being said, it doesn't give us an awful lot of information about MOA, which is mechanism of action. In other words, it tells us nothing about how this is really functioning. All we see is we see generally the results in animals, but we have no way of necessarily determining how this occurs. So we use a couple of different systems, one which is called co-transfection, where we introduce uh, two pieces of DNA, one which is the exon one, the fragment, the, the N -term, containing the N-terminal fragment of the Huntington's, and that's associated with, uh, and, and and, and then, then we introduce INT41 on it, on it as well. So we, we introduce both of these. And what we were able to observe in that particular system is that we inhibit aggregation by about 95% with INT41. Now this is obviously a more ideal system than in animal systems. And, and, but essentially we're seeing the same kind of thing because in the INT41 case, or in the co-transfection case, we're delivering these at the same time. So you don't have, like you do in the animals, already preformed aggregates. The other thing we saw is a reduction in gene direct dysregulation. I'll get to that in just a minute. So the second cell system that we use is called a PC12. And the, the big difference between these is that with the co-transfection, you have an efficiency issue when you're delivering two genes at the same time. So we wanted a system where we could turn on a gene, the human gene, the complete human gene, with a, uh, with a, a small molecule drug and uh, transduce or introduce, infect those cells with the recombinant virus that would express INT41. That would get us the ability to have uh, uniform expression of the mutant human gene along with uniform expression of INT41 throughout the entire population. So those are the two cell systems that we use and let me give you some of the, a little bit of the data around this. So this is the data for um, reducing cell aggregation in cells and if you look at, we introduced, um, if you look on the far left, you see the non-transfected, and that's basically a control. If you look at exon 1, GFP, Q30, well, those are, that's a normal uh, glutamine uh, expansion length. And you see on the right called GFP fluorescence, and you see distribution into three different regions of increasing fluorescence, 66%, 24%, and 9.5% uh, roughly. When you look at Q103, which is the expanded, you see in the GFP fluorescence a shift that these are being shifted out of the low fluorescence range into the high fluorescence range. And what that essentially means is that you're forming larger aggregates. So when you see that going from 9.5% to about 23%, that's an increase in the aggregate size. When you use INT41 with Q103, you drop that down significantly. So you drop down the aggregates and you go back to what is a, a normal distribution 
that you see with the, the Q30. And we saw the same thing with the HAP1, but in the animal system, that's where we ran into the problems with the HAP1 model. So that's the first piece of data that shows in the cell-based system, we can, uh, we can model the same thing that we see in the animal system with reduced aggregation. The next thing we did was to take this and uh, we isolated RNA and sent it to a, a company on the West Coast. And um, they probed uh, about 29,000 genes. So they looked at a wide range of genes and looked for normal as opposed to abnormal um, uh, expression of those genes. So what the, the, the results I'm showing you here are really only uh, um, what a dozen or 14 of those genes. What we saw of several hundred genes, and you look at the very bottom with the asterisk, just over a thousand genes to, the, to a, uh, a high um, confidence level were altered in their regulation. They were either over-regulated or under-regulated compared to normal cells. And 88% uh, of those genes were very highly associated, very tight association. So if you look at a few of these, and I'll just kind of briefly go through it, if you look at the, the, the gene is on the far left, PQ103 is the, of course, the the pathologic uh, extension of, of glutamine. And you see the first set up here of a half a dozen or so that are down-regulated, where one represents normal, and all these fractions represent a reduction from normal. So you have about a roughly a 50% or so reduction in the expression of those genes. You look at the next group down, and those are all overexpression. So, uh, for example, the UBE 2J2 is six times uh, higher expression in Q103 than it is in, uh, the, in the normal, which would be one. And you see the same thing on down. When you introduce in the next column and you express both PQ103 and INT41 at the same time, you see these start to go back to the normal. They're not all the way back, but you see that they're about 50% of the way back. More importantly was, is, is that when you look at INT41 alone, you're not seeing any gene dysregulation. So these are essentially not changed from normal, except for a couple that are involved in protein production and degradation, which you would expect because you've introduced something into the cell. The cell is making INT41 and then it has to degrade INT41, just like it does with uh, virtually any other uh, protein product. So you've introduced something, uh, and, and it's, it's basically taking care of it. And the important part of that is that it, it's, it's going through what a, a normal process of production and, and degradation. So we see that INT41 can correct uh, this gene dysregulation problem, but it didn't tell us a lot about the uh, the mechanism. We basically were able to confirm that yes, we're seeing we're seeing some things that are leading us in the right direction in terms of our understanding of the pathology and what might be driving the pathology. The next thing we turned to was the the, the PC12 system of the two systems that I described, where we can get uniform expression throughout the entire population of both. Uh, a, a, a mutant Huntington gene, as well as INT41. And we could then take those cells, which is what we did, and fractionate those and track where these N-terminal fragments are going from the cytoplasmic, membrane, nuclear soluble, chromatin bound, and finally a cytoskeletal skeletal fraction. So what we did was then to begin to track these and to, to try to understand where, where these fragments are going and, and essentially what they're doing. So the first slide here, <clears throat> and this is what's called a Western blot, and I won't uh, try to explain the details of that, but the, if you look at, you have, we have two cell lines, one Q23, which is a normal um, uh, length, 
and another Q73, which is the abnormal length. If you look at the 6, 8, and 11 under the Q23, uh, those are days, and ETOH is ethanol. So it's basically a carrier that was used to uh, introduce the drug called PON A. And that gives us uh, what is the endogenous gene. So the cells have their own gene that they're producing, as well as the uh, gene that was that was inserted uh, into those cells. That's a full-length human gene, and that's in the next uh, A. So upon A is the what we found is that there's about a six to nine-fold increase in expression of the human gene, and uh, as opposed to the uh, the endogenous gene, and that becomes important in terms of understanding what we're actually visualizing when we when we see this. And this is really a control experiment to to again get the um, get the kinetics of production right, so we reach a steady state. And so when we analyze this, we want to make sure that the production and the degradation process has reached a steady state, and this is happening in a continuous process. So the next slide then is the um, <coughs> is the um, uh, the uh, the data that is uh, on the on the subcellular fractionation. And let me focus your attention onto the uh, the the ones below that are chromatin. And these, what you're visualizing is the amount of the N-terminal fragment that's binding to DNA. And we call that the chromatin fraction. If you look at Q23, M is the, uh, the mock or unaltered Q23. And you see a, a low level terminal fragments to DNA. But when you look at Q73, the M, you see something that's a, 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 at least a six and a half to, uh, to tenfold increase in the binding to DNA. So that confirms what other people have seen in these N-terminal fragments binding to DNA, probably binding to RNA as well as transcription factors as well. It's driving not only an aggregation process, but also probably driving the gene dysregulation process. If you look at the next column under the chromatin where it says 41, those are the cells that are also expressing INT41. What we observe here is that the in the Q73 where it says 41, we see the, the binding of these N-terminal toxic fragments to DNA is reduced down to normal levels. So that way if you compare 41, Q73, 41 column, the Q23, M column. Those are essentially uh, the same. So what INT41 appears to be doing is stabilizing these N-terminal fragments and preventing them or inhibiting the process of binding to DNA. And that is directly correlated to the alteration of gene dysregulation that we've just shown. And we can see that INT41 is also expressed in all of these fragments as, or in all of these subcellular compartments as well. So the, the key to this is that the fragments are able to get into the nucleus. They bind to DNA. And let me show you a model of how we believe this is actually occurring. So you see the HTT on the left that's being degraded uh, by, um, by proteases and producing N-terminal fragments that are driving a process of aggregation. So those aggregates are typically uh, put into inclusions and they're basically packaged up in, in what's called an inclusion body and the, and the cell has a way of typically trying to dispose of those. These Fragments, though, uh, uh, are difficult for the cell to digest, and that's what proteasome degradation is. So it, 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 
it blocks partially this process of proteasome degradation, although the data on that is, um, is variable depending on the lab. Some people have seen a block in protein in Huntington's degradation, others have not. But you produce these N-terminal toxic fragments that are in the cytoplasm, and that's these, these half-moon circles in the center. Those go through what's called the nuclear pore into the nucleus and bind to uh, DNA and at the same time are forming uh, nuclear aggregates. So uh, one of the hallmarks of Huntington's is the aggregation. You get a single very large aggregate in the, uh, in the nucleus. But that binding to uh, DNA, we believe, is driving the process of gene dysregulation and we believe that's the case because INT41 will inhibit the binding to DNA and also inhibit the gene dysregulation. And gene dysregulation long term can actually lead to, uh, to cell death. It's, uh, uh, so we believe this is part of the process at least that leads to neuron loss. So how is this all really happening? And this is a very simple model. That, uh, that we think explains it. And it actually boils down to some very fairly simple chemistry. Uh, so you're, what you're seeing is an HTT molecule, a big glob there in red, white, and blue, <coughs> uh, interacting with DNA. And the reason that it can interact in that way is that DNA is negatively charged and you have a very large amount of DNA. Uh, the, these N-terminal Huntington fragments are positively charged so when you introduce these, they bind the Huntington fragments that are positively charged bind to DNA. So you see this increase in DNA binding as you increase the number of glutamines because you increase the positive charge. And that's driving the gene dysregulation process. So if you look at the on the right where it says proline rich, there are two target sequences in the proline-rich region. Now, the proline-rich region, as I mentioned before, is a site of protein-protein interaction. And this, there are a number of, uh, quite a few proteins that have proline-rich regions that can drive an aggregation process. What we believe is occurring is that as INT41 is binding to these proline-rich regions, it's stabilizing that molecule and inhibiting the uh, uh, the process of aggregation and at the same time uh, altering the uh, ability to bind to DNA because this poly Q is going to be rather than being folded up is going to be exposed. So this is what we would view um, is, is happening in the case of uh, cells that are expressing INT41. Um, You've got the Huntington's fragments that are being generated, but these are being uh, bound by INT41, which is the green circles binding to the, uh, to the black half moons. Uh, if you treat early enough, you shouldn't see any alteration in proteasome degradation. Some of the data, which I didn't try to articulate because of the complexity of it, shows us that INT41 binding in the cytoplasm reduces the um, transportation of these toxic and terminal fragments into the nucleus. So once they get into the nucleus, so the INT41 is stabilizing those molecules. It's blocking their binding to DNA, reducing the formation of nuclear aggregates, and reducing uh, gene dysregulation. So we believe that INT41 then is targeting uh, an endpoint in, in the, uh, the protein turnover cycle that, that is driving at least uh, what we believe is a major, uh, major elements of, uh, of, of the progression, uh, of the pathology related to progression. So it's binding to these fragments. It's altering transport into the cell, into the nucleus, altering the binding in the nucleus and altering the aggregation process. And we believe that's done by uh, stabilizing the uh, structure. 
And there's a number of reasons to believe that it's working that way, and that would relate to other proteins where antibody or interactions with these um, proline-rich regions uh, has been shown to uh, to be a, a, a not only a driver of protein-protein aggregation, but also uh, neutralizing that effect can neutralize the aggregation process. So some of the key takeaways from the from the data is that we're not seeing any uh, toxicity in the in the R62 model. Uh, so that uh, that's a positive. Uh, although, again, remember this is a mouse model, and the next step is to go into uh, uh, a, a larger model, which is or a larger animal, which is going to be a non-human primate animal, to get former uh, for, formal toxicology data. Uh, and AAV, by and large, has been used in um, uh, Parkinson's and uh, a number of other diseases, particularly if you look at the neurological symptom or the neurological diseases like Parkinson's. And it's shown to have a, a good safety profile so far. The other thing that we note is that INT41 does not accumulate in the cell. So like any other protein that's being made, it's being made and degraded. So, and that's, that's very important, because if it does accumulate in the cell, that's going to lead to pathology. Uh, the RNA array expressions, or the, basically the gene expression data, shows us that we're not seeing any, anything that we can tell from that data an off-target effect. So INT41 is not altering gene expression itself, so it's neutral in that regard. And it doesn't seem to, and I don't have the, uh, I haven't shown a lot of this data, but one important element here is that we don't affect the normal Huntington uh, uh, allele. So you're making, as I mentioned, a normal Huntington gene as well as the mutated Huntington gene. The data that we have so far suggests that the INT41 is predominantly interacting with these fragments and not the uh, not the full length Huntington gene. We believe that's the case because in the full length, which is a, it's a membrane bound protein, this uh, uh, this proline rich region is involved in protein pro protein interactions. There are a number of proteins that interact with the Huntington protein in 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 the function, and we think that that site is actually hidden. Uh, from, uh, from from the ability of uh, interacting with INT41, and it's only after degradation that it becomes exposed. Uh, so our our plan right now is we're we're in discussions uh, the, the the latter stages of discussions with a uh, global partner working on a uh, not only a work plan to get into the clinic uh, but also a, uh, a, a clinical plan as well. Uh, we expect that in uh, 2017 there are a number of animal models or a number of animal studies that we want to uh, complete in order to get <clears throat> what's called IND or investigational new drug enabling data which would allow us then to go into the clinic. One of the key issues, as I uh, as we just talked about a moment ago, is that uh, fourth bullet down is we want to basically confirm that we're not affecting the normal Huntington gene or the normal Huntington product, basically. So we've got some studies planned to be able to do that. We would go into manufacturing uh, the by the end of next year, early uh, the following year. We have a toxicology study with non-human primates that <clears throat> excuse me, will be completed in the 2018 time frame. And we have a, a phase two, a phase one, two a pivotal trial that we have planned in the 2018-19 time frame. This would be uh, 40 to 60 patients where we would use uh, multimodal neuroimaging that can measure caudate atrophy. So caudate is a part of the brain that shrinks in the um, 
um, so we can we can measure shrinkage of part of the brain and the uh, and that occurs in a largely a linear fashion with progression of the disease and then we would use the normal uh, cognitive and motor function tests as, a, as, as well. But we thought the multimodal neuroimaging was really important because in, uh, uh, it's, it's a, something that in six month increments we can really track on an individual patient basis what, whether or not the, the brain cells are, 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 are dying or, or whether they're uh, uh, relatively normal. So the caudate atrophy part we think is really, uh, really quite important. And that's the, um, yeah, it's the last slide that I have. So be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You might have. Thanks. Ooh, there's some sneezing here. Uh, thanks, Lee, so much. Um, appreciate that. So there, if you have any questions, we do have some time to, for questions for Dr. Henderson. Uh, please ask them at any, at any point in the, uh, using the questions box. Um, there is one, oops, pull out. I was wondering if you could, uh, attendee is, is inquiring if you could elaborate a little bit more on your selection of why you picked AAV6 and, you know, this, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and, and on top of that, as you were talking about this, and you had mentioned that you were at uh, collaborating with Caltech, I was reminded of a really exciting paper that came out of Caltech. It was published, I think, in la late last year, or early last year, um, in Nature Biotech, looking at these new types of uh, serotypes of viruses, the PHP A and B from um, Ben Deverman's lab, or Ben Deverman is the, the author, where you can actually administer IV as opposed to intrastriatally, as you guys are doing. Have you ever thought about doing that? With the intrabody, yeah, we've looked at the uh, at the uh, at that approach a little bit. We're, we'll, we are looking at that in more detail. The issue is being able to get it to the uh, to the striatum in significant enough amounts to really make a difference. So the delivery, uh, there are there are also some work out of UMass showing uh, with certain serotypes that could be delivered systemically but then the amount that actually gets to the brain is fairly small. So the, some of the concerns are, do, are there, are there off-target effects that might happen if you're only delivering a small percentage to the brain and are you delivering a significant amount? So we're following those studies to see whether or not there are other options. Uh, there are also some, uh, some newer uh, serotype data on uh, AAV1 and 2 that we're looking at. So I think our non-human primate uh, studies are going to probably be utilizing several different <coughs> uh, viral strains in order to look at those issues specifically and compare them to AAV6. The reason we chose AAV6 is because it, it exhibits what's called retrograde transport. So we can deliver it to the striatum and it will be transported back to some of the other regions of the brain that are involved in, uh, uh, in that are significantly involved in, in Huntington's progression. Whereas something like AAV2, which is anti-grade, if you deliver it to the striatum, it can't get back to those regions. <clears throat> the other reason is that uh, AAV6 is very neurotropic. AAV2, of course, is as well. But the, um, <clears throat> and and we had a, a primate, non-human primate studies that were done by uh, Chris Brankowitz's group that, uh, that have really led us down that path. Although um, in talking to Chris uh, in the last year or so, um, they did some studies with uh, another group uh, that, that shows that some of these newer serotypes might actually uh, be better. So I think to answer your question, I think the key is going to be designing a primate study where we can test these head-to-head. -head. Okay, thanks, Lee. Um, the question regarding your interesting data where you saw a, a unique difference between the males and the females that were given, that were treated with the intrabody in your, um, the R62, this is the mouse model data that you presented, where the, the females seem to respond to the drug when they looked at the, I believe it was the T T 
T-maze, the T-swim uh, swim test, and the males did not respond. And I'm wondering if, since you sacrifice those animals and you have their, their brains, did you look at the aggregates to see if that correlated to why the drug didn't seem to affect the males? Did the, did the aggregates, were they not impacted by the males versus the females? Uh, actually, actually uh, that's true. What we saw, what this has been observed in the R6-2 is that the female mice are a little bit slower in progression, but we see that it does track the aggregates. So you see reduction in, in the aggregates, but to a much smaller degree in the males than in the females. So there is a concordance of that kind of data uh, when you look at males and females. We think that if we had done that swim test, say, two weeks earlier, we would have seen the same kind of things in the, in the males had we been able to introduce uh, INT41 rather than at five weeks, it's something like you know three or four weeks. Uh, our concern was whether or not um, that was really, well, you know, you, you, you're going to be administering in humans at a point where patients are either close to symptomatic or perhaps symptomatic. So I think when you do the things in animals, we're trying to do them at a stage where you're beginning to see that same transition. But I think that that's, yeah, I think if we had, if we were able to go back, we have seen the correlation in aggregates between males and females and the cognitive ability. And so that does correlate quite well. And uh, if we'd gone a little earlier in the uh, in the uh, in the swim test, we may have seen a broader difference in the uh, in the males as well. Another question regarding so so the INT forty one is an, an intrabody that binds to this poly this proline rich region, which is present in Huntington, but it's also present in I don't know how many, but maybe you do, Lee. How many a number of proteins in our body? I'm, Yes. Perhaps it's hundreds, um, but and you showed that at least in a, a in a the HEC two nine three cells that it didn't at least globally seem to affect transcription too much. Um, that's one thing. But did you look at some key poly or proline rich proteins to see if INT forty one disrupted their function? They they may not be altered in gene transcription, but they may be, be if this antibodies or intrabodies binding to them, they're unable to do their normal function. Yeah, that's something that we actually have planned in the in the next set of uh, of studies to do. So we plan on getting that uh, launched fairly soon. So there are a number of those that we'll be looking at. Um, one of the and that that was an issue when we um, when we were thinking about this whole um, approach. And the, pro, and the proline rich regions because as you mentioned there, there are lots of these proline rich regions or there are literally hundreds of proteins that have them. So what we have, INT41, one of the things that uh, uh, we, we discussed with Caltech is, is it, do we want to drive uh, the affinity maturation process? So do we want to get an interbody that has higher and higher affinity? We have an intrabody now in INT41 that actually has fairly low affinity. It's in the uh, in the uh, the low micromolar range, um, and my concern with going to higher affinity is that you're going to begin to disrupt these normal protein-protein interactions that do occur at these sites. So the part of the selection of a lower affinity intrabody was to really address that uh, that issue as well. But I think you know the point is well taken and those studies are planned to look at whether or not we disruption disrupt function of, of other uh, proline rich regions and other proteins. Thanks Lee. Um, just one last question from the audience and uh, just in general you know I, I know you've got your work set ahead of you for the next couple of years in terms of finishing up the preclinical work, but is there anything that you can think of that groups like HGSA or just the patient population, the HD community can do to assist you or groups like Vibion in pushing things forward? Well, I think, I think it's an engagement process and, and I think this is one of the things that uh, 
that really facilitates that. So that, and part of it is for us in forums like this to be able to talk about what we're doing, but also at the same time hear from not only patients, uh, caregivers, but also, you know, obviously some other, other scientific points of view, other, uh, uh, other questions. Have we thought about this or have we thought about that? So I think that this, this level of engagement is really where we want to be going forward in being able to, uh, to continue to talk to HDSA and talk to uh, patient groups and as well as the scientific community. So I'm giving a talk in, uh, in a few months in Boston and, uh, and, and, and keeping that, that engagement up I think will to, is, is really the most important thing we can do. Great. Thank you, Lee. Couldn't agree more. So um, I want to thank you for your time. We're right at 1 o'clock, so right on time. And thank everyone for dialing in. Uh, thank you again, uh, Lee, for your, all the time you put into this presentation and for joining us. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you and from Vibeyond in the future. And uh, please join us in the new year for the, the next webinar on January 11th where we'll hear about the Pride HD results. So that's it for now, and I hope everyone has a happy holiday and a healthy new year. Talk to you soon.